Um, last week we were at 25 to 37. This week we're going to be at Luke 12. <laughs> and that, that was not even what we were last week. This week we're going to be at Luke 12, 13 to 21 is where we're going to start out reading this morning. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brothers to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an, in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take, it, take life easy. Eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. Let us pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, it's a living word, and we praise you for it. I thank you for each one here, Lord, and I pray that if this message, if this scripture is meant for someone here this morning, Lord, or many here this morning, that you would touch their hearts. Lord, that they would be open to it. Help me to speak clearly. Help me to speak boldly this morning, Lord. And I praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. The last week, again, we talked about being on guard. On guard from what? The enemy. The enemy that in 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So yes, we need to be alert. We need to be on guard when it comes to our enemy. But more than that, specifically, we talked last week about one of his tools he uses. And hopefully you remember what it was. It started with an F. What was it last week that we talked about? Anybody can talk. It's okay. Fear. Fear. We talked about fear last week. Now, I think it's his biggest weapon. I think it's mo most of the time it's the only weapon he uses because out of fear he can get a whole bunch of different reactions. He can get us to make a whole bunch of bad choices just from fear. We have a lot of different ways we respond to fear. It's his, it's his biggest weapon. Last week I said that we're going to talk about building up treasures for ourselves in heaven. And I, I'm going to get to that. But it stuck in my mind this week as I, as I did this message. Fear. Under, I don't think any of us really can grasp how much fear affects our daily lives. Even how it affects our witness for Christ. It keeps us crippled. It keeps us from truly expressing our love for Christ. I'm no different. Fear has dictated most of the choices I've made throughout my life. It's still, it's still in there today. I still fear some things. You see, I grew up with little. Little expectations from anyone of me doing anything. Little expectations for myself for a while. We didn't have much. Much was taken from us, or we felt so at the time as siblings. So I made this, this inner vow when I was younger that I'd do better. That I would be better than, than, than anybody my family had been. I would do better than, than what anybody expected me to do. I'd make better choices. I'd be a better dad. I'd be a better husband. I'd provide for my family. I'd protect for my family. That I'd make better choices than the family members that were dead because they made a lot of bad choices. Or the ones that were living dead pretty much because they're still making bad choices. But I did all that. And, and as I thought about that as I was writing this on paper, you know what I saw in all of that? Me. Myself. I, 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 I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, all by myself. And I made those choices because I was afraid. You know, there's that, uh, that fear of disappointing someone, that fear of letting somebody down, that fear of failing, that afraid of making whoever said you wanted to amount to something, making them right. You know, there's always that, I'm going to prove them wrong. There's that fear. I was doing it out of fear. I was being selfish because I was afraid. But I didn't have to be. I didn't know it at that point. 
I had the wrong fear. That was a fear. I, well, at that point, I didn't know there was any difference. You see, whether we focus on worldly things or on heavenly things, it's based on what kind of fear we're feeling. What kind of fear? We talked about last week, there's two kinds. There's a fear that comes from the pressure of the evil one, that comes from the pressure of the devil, the fear that, that makes us be afraid, that makes us make bad choices. And then there's a fear of our Lord God. Two different things. Same word, two totally different things. And before we go a lot further, we've got to talk about fear for a minute. What is it? What's the difference between the two? Because fear means a couple different things, like I said, but it gets two totally different. It can generate two totally different responses in our lives. Two totally different reactions. When we talk about fear that's placed in us by the enemy, it's a type of fear that cripples us, that keeps us from make, making sound decisions. It affects everything we do. We become afraid. Afraid of failing, of Afraid of being rejected, afraid of getting hurt, or, or hurting somebody else's feelings for that matter. That's the fear we're, we're all aware of. We've all felt that. And we're all afraid of something. We all know what that one feels like. But then there's another one. Not the traditional fear. Many of you here, think about it before we get to the other one. Most of you are afraid of something right now. Or, you were, or fear dictated what you did this morning on your way to church. What you said this morning on your way to church. Think about it. Think about your discussion with your kids. Ken Davis kind of jokes about this a little bit with the Sunday morning look of love, if you've heard that one. But think about this. When you were getting ready this morning, some of you thought, oh, we're going to be late for church. You know, you're getting mad because you're going to be late for church. Somebody's going to notice. So I walked in the door five minutes late this morning. And, well, so-and-so, they're never late. And they're going to see me. Or my hair's not just quite right and so-and-so is always perfect. She's going to see my hair's messed up and I just, ah, oh, you know, all by fear. Or, or my kid's going to make noise in church and, and somebody's going to notice that. I'm just going to look like an awful parent and that's all out of fear. Nobody really cares. It's just we do that to ourselves. That's how easily fear can influence what we do. Those are silly examples, but it's true. We're worried about what somebody else is going to say or what somebody else is going to think. They might not even think it. It's just in our head. It gets into our, into our brains what we think in the morning, every morning. And all these things, they turn what should be a Sunday morning of, of getting renewed in the presence of the Lord and, and a chance to absorb the Word of God. Pretty soon we're just freaking out because what everybody else that's here is thinking, and we're all thinking that. It's, but that's how easy, it's just an example of how easy fear can dictate what we do, what we say, how we act. That's that fear that's consuming, it's gripping, it's debilitating. It's, it's that ball and chain that never lets us move forward because we let it dictate what we do. That's the fear that consumes us daily, even though it should not. So we're going to work on that. The other kind of fear is mentioned in verse 5 of chapter 12. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after the body has been killed has the authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. To develop a fear of the Lord is completely different than the fear that comes from the enemy. The kind of fear develops, this kind of fear develops as we, as we make progress in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. As we witness the life-changing experiences that stem from the act of accepting Christ. The act of receiving forgiveness, of being redeemed, it's a different fear. It's described different. When you look it up, I was looking it up. It can best be described. And somebody questioned me on this after the sermon last week, and I thought, I should have went into that because it's different. It's something that I didn't understand as a new Christian. It can best be described as reverence and all. One might use the words utmost respect. You can liken it to your relationship with your earthly father. Or what a good or good relationship with an earthly father, or I should say father figure, could be. Now, there's the catch. That's part of why it's so hard to understand this, because most of us don't have that perfect relationship with a father. Most of us didn't have that ideal godly relationship. Or most, some of us aren't being a good godly father. It's hard to know what that feels like. 
if we haven't experienced it. But it's no coincidence that that's what it's like them to. God gives directions in his word for being a good father, for raising children for a reason. Because it's designed that we would understand that fear. Now, my father being he was killed when I was very young, and the other one we had our spats, but there was always a respect. The respect part of fear. That as a man you respected that person. Even a father figure, you understood that. It's a different kind of fear. It's not the, the trembling fear. We trust our Father. We trust Him because we know He'll take care of us. We, we don't want to dis we fear disappointing Him. We fear not living up to the standards. It's not the same. We want to please Him like we want to please our earthly Father. We want to do well. We want to bring others to know Him because we know that He loves us. We know that He cares for us. It's a different kind of fear. When they talk about fear of the Lord, it's not the laying on the floor trembling fear because you're afraid you're going to get punished. It's, the, it's not that. I didn't understand that. I'm still working on it. It's a hard one to grasp. But for so many, it's difficult, like I said, because they haven't experienced a relationship like that. Now, verse 5 says, we should fear the one who has the power to throw us into hell. And he does. He has that power. That part sounds a little scary, doesn't it? If you don't know Christ, if you haven't accepted Christ, then that is scary. If you realize he has that power, but you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ, then that can be a little scary. Because you realize what's going to happen, what he has the power to do. But the awe part comes from the fact that he doesn't want to. He has the power to do that. He has the power to throw us into hell. But he says, no, you don't have to go there. All you have to do is come to me. All you have to do is put your faith in Jesus Christ. And ask for forgiveness for your sins. And, and you're not going there. That's the all part. That's the awesome part. That's not so scary, is it? That's not a bad thing. not his intent to put us in hell even though the power is there. He tells us in the scriptures, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of his head are all numbered. Of your head, sorry. Don't be afraid, you are worth more than many sparrows. He's saying, look at them, two little birds. <coughs> worth nothing. And I care about them. How much more do I care about you. He doesn't want to see any perish. And all he asks that we do is believe in Jesus Christ. When you realize that we belong to a just God, that our Father in Heaven is merciful, forgiving, filled with joy at each one that comes to Him, that His greatest desire is for us to come to Him, then you will start to develop that reverence and that awe that they call the fear of the Lord. Until we choose between the worldly fear and the heavenly fear, we can't build up our treasures in heaven. The worldly fear is what keeps us from doing that. We can't have treasure piled up here on earth. We can't have a bank full of money over there storing it up for that one day we might need it and have our account in heaven full. Think about that. You can't wire between the two. It doesn't work that way. There's no ATM. They don't connect. Our scriptures from this morning start out. Verse 13, someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me judge or arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. He's telling this to those he's speaking to. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. What was the man worried about here? His worldly inheritance, as he said. Stuff. And that day, it wasn't a bunch of money. It wasn't, I mean, there wasn't a ton of currency there. It was livestock. It was land. It was grains. All the stuff he was worried about that he was going to get. He was worried about stuff. He wanted his share. And what does Jesus do? <clears throat> then he said to them, watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Your life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. 
an abundance of possession. New King James says, one's life does not consist in an abundance of the things he possesses. Now there's those who take these scriptures out of context, who take them to an extreme, I'm going to live as poorly as possible, I'm going to have nothing, I'm going to put myself in hardship on purpose, because that will make, make me better, it will make me more ready for Christ. That's not what he's saying here. He's just trying to warn us against greed. He's not telling you you can never have anything ever. I'm not going to bless you with anything. It's not what he's saying. He's warning us against accruing needless worldly junk that's going to stay here long after we're gone. We don't need it where we're going. Whether you're going to heaven or hell, it doesn't matter. You don't need what you have here. What you're accruing is not going with you either way. He continues in verse 16 and 19. And he told them this parable, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. <coughs> he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns. I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store up my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be merry. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Go to Maui. Sit on the beach. He has done well for himself here. This, this guy, it's not that he... It's why he wants. It's what he wants to do with what he has. He's worked hard. He's made good business decisions. He's reaped an abundant harvest. So much so that he doesn't have room for it all. <laughs> Not wanting it to go bad. Thinking of the potential future gain out of this. The potential for income out of it. So I'll store it for myself. I don't have to worry about anything ever again. I am set for life. I'm just going to take it easy. I'm going to chill worry about me. Verse 20, 21 says, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from me. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. All that work, all the crops, the barns, the money made, and in the blink of an eye, he's gone. Think about it. Life is that short. My grandpa was bailing hay in the hayfield and he was dead like that with a massive heart attack. Gone. All this stuff is still there. Nothing moving. Think about that. Still here waiting for the next earthly owner, waiting for the next highest bidder. That stuff's of no value to God. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God, it says. You see, the fear of going without, the fear of not being successful caused this man to focus more on having enough for this world, just in case, when it wasn't this world they needed to be focusing on. This man took his time, his talent, his wisdom, all these things given to him by our Creator, put in him by a Creator for a reason, to build up a false security made of stuff that he was going to leave behind. When he leaves this world, he had a worldly fear, a worldly focus. And if we're not careful, we'll fall into that same path. That's the path I was on. I'm going to have this. I'm going to have to leave this and this and this for my kids. I, I have to make sure they have enough. I have to make sure it looks like I did well. I have to make it look like I, I set them up for life. Yeah, keep that account growing and growing and growing, the stuff piling up. But, but the scroll in heaven that they're going to roll out when we stand there was pretty short. Do we need certain things to survive? Yeah, we do. The Lord knows that. We have to make a living. We do have to provide for our families. Absolutely. But the Lord knows that. And he expects us to work. He expects us to earn. But what is our motivation for doing so? Are we doing so to honor him? Are we doing so in a way that, that brings others to a knowledge of Jesus Christ? It says, man, why do you work with such emphasis? Why do you have a purpose? Why are you so pleasant? Why, why are you nice to me? Why do you help me out when you can? What do we do with that extra that God provides? Because he will bless us. When we're doing it for the right reasons, he does bless us. He does take care of us. He gives us what we need. Not always what we want. Sometimes we're a little bent because we don't get what we want, but he, we get what we need. What do we do with that little bit of extra? Do we store it up? Do we put it away? For, or do we use it for the kingdom work of our Lord? 
Verse 21, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. What does that even mean? Not rich towards God. Does he want your money? I'm not talking about the offering plate on Sunday morning. <coughs> the Lord did bless us. He gave us talents. He gave us abilities. He gave us knowledge. He gives us wisdom if we follow him. All that stuff he gave to us to use, to use for his kingdom, to use to bring others to him, to glorify him, to say, yeah, I can do this, but it's because God gave me the ability to do it. The Lord desires first and foremost a relationship with him. He also desires each and every one of us to, to make that our daily focus, our life focus of bringing the good news of the gospel to people who don't know. He wants us to live not as though we have, we're saving for another 50 years of retirement, so I'll, I'll get to you then, Lord. I'll focus on you then when I get there. Our work, our jobs, raising our children, coaching ball, anything you do can be done to the glory of the Lord, can be done in a way of service to the Lord when it's done for the right reasons. Matthew 24 gives us a sobering <laughs> idea of why it's important, why we need to have the right kind of fear, why we need to be focused on the Lord. Starting in verse 36. But about the day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man, for in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, and the other left. Two men will be grinding at the hand of one will be taken, the other left. Sorry, two women. Before, therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day the Lord will come. No one knows. So what are we living for? Are we prepared? What is the purpose with which we're working? What is the purpose with which we go about our day when we interact with people? <coughs> What's important is doing what we're doing with the underlying mission of letting the world know about Jesus Christ. Our time, our talents, our knowledge, all of which comes to us by God, are given to us for that reason to share with the world so that they might know Him through us. It's not as hard as it sounds. It's not as scary as it sounds. But it is a decision. It's a daily decision. I have to make the decision every day. How can I impact someone today? How can I bless someone today? Some days I'm really bad at it. We all have bad days. How can I love somebody today? There are days I don't feel like loving everybody. Or anybody for that matter. But it's a choice we have to make. How can I love somebody today while doing my job? That coworker that's tough to deal with, how can I love that person today? Well, how can I do all this while caring for my family, while being a faithful spouse? Anybody here who's married can tell. There's days you and your spouse just butt heads. It's, it's the way it works. If you say no, you're lying and <laughs> they end up with him. <laughs> You would be lying. We are given the choice. We have to make the choice every day to follow God, to do what we do for God. It's an everyday choice, a lifestyle choice. <coughs> Think about that. Are we, I have to remind myself I'm here to serve God. Not me, not my selfish desires. I have to decide not to let my fear of what could happen or what somebody might think, dictate what I'm going to do that day. What someone might think. What I do, what you do each day needs to be done because we have a deep love, a deep admiration, a deep respect for our Father in Heaven. We have that fear of the Lord. So much so that we want the world to know. In doing this, in, in living a life modeled after Christ, after his example, we can focus on bringing others to a saving knowledge of him. We will indeed store up those treasures in heaven when we've done that. 
And, he won't, and then one day, we're going to stand there. And that scroll's going to hit the floor when he opens it. And you'll get to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You'll get to see the names of those who you impacted. You won't even know it. You're impacting people every day that you don't know about. Lives are touched. The world is changed because people make that decision every morning to live for Christ. Not to be afraid of the world. Not to be afraid of what people think. That's what you're fed every day anymore. It's fear, 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 fear. There's a song I shared it online. If you can find it, fear is a lie. I'd never heard it before last night. And man, that is just so awesome. And it's so true. Fear is a lie. Keep that in mind. Don't be afraid of the world. Live your life focusing on God with a healthy fear, a healthy respect, and, and awe for the Lord our God, who has saved us, who has brought us here all this morning. Let us close in a word of prayer this morning. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you this morning, Lord, that it is, it is that healthy fear, that respect, that awe of you this morning, Lord, that, that put me here standing before these people this morning. Lord, hopefully that's what brought them here. Lord, the admiration for you, wanting to know more about you, wanting to, to serve you, Lord, wanting, knowing that you're a merciful God, that you're, you're a joyful God, and you love us. You're not standing there like a prison guard, but like a father. Lord, who loves us. Lord, who wants us to succeed. Who wants us to do well. Who wants us to go from here and reach others. Lord, who, to show them what it is to have a Father in Heaven. One that loves us no matter what. That unconditional love that Walt talked about this morning, Lord. Other than no, it's only found in you, Lord. Father, you love us no matter what. You offer us forgiveness, Lord. Praise you for that this morning. We thank you for that this morning. Lord, help each one as they go from here, Lord, to know that you are, they are surrounded by your presence, that you are encamped around each one of them. Lord, that they can be bold for you, Lord. They don't have to worry about what somebody else thinks. But what the world tells them they're doing wrong, what the world says they have to do. Help us to fear only you. Thank you for this this morning, Lord. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.